Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Our guest today is Hannah Teta, a United Nations Under Secretary General and the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General to the African Union. In previous roles, she served as Director General of the UN Office at Nairobi and for several years as the Foreign Minister of Ghana. She's on the show today to speak with us on a number of topics dealing with the region and the continent, and her role representing the UN at the AU, as well as the AU's effectiveness as a tool of peace and security now and in the future. Under Secretary General, welcome to the Horn. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, and thank you for having me. So Africa faces a crunch of a number of upcoming elections, uh, including in this region in Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Somalia. We've seen signs that some regimes have capitalized on the COVID-19 crisis to tighten the political space, uh, including a lot of contestations around postponed elections. Do you fear we are seeing a democratic backslide in the wake of the pandemic? I wouldn't put it as strongly as that, but certainly democratic systems are coming under stress. And the reason why I wouldn't put it as strongly as that is because I think that democracy itself is a process that involves the contestation of power, and at the same time, the opening of the civic space for a variety of actors. And those actors in all of those countries continue to make their voices heard, albeit under strained circumstances because of the COVID pandemic. And you realize that even though there have been some measures taken by um, respective governments within the Horn in order to postpone elections or to... um, change the way in which um, the arrangements are being made. You have seen that none of those positions have gone unchallenged. And I think that for as long as there is an ongoing debate and conversation as to what needs to be done within each member state to ensure a free and fair election, and that the government is having to listen to others and at the same time take those considerations on board in taking its own actions, I think that even though there is, there was perhaps the use of COVID as an opportunity to delay the democratic process, I think that that has been uncomfortable for every government that has tried it. Do you think there are still concerns that it might? Do you think this is something for, for the continental leaders to sort of keep on their radar? You see, I don't think Africa's democracies is just about its leaders. Civil society, business, the business community, academia, young people are increasingly using every opportunity they have to make their voices heard, to make their positions on issues known, and at the same time to demand from their governments accountability and to demand from their governments the kind of responsive actions that they require in order for them to feel that indeed their opinions matter and the issues that are of concern to them are being addressed. So in as much as you know, I understand the import of your question and, and perhaps the reason why, you know, it could be seen that way. I think it's important for us to realize that though the leadership of the continent is important, they are not the only people who matter and they are not the only people who make decisions. And I think that in the, the process of democratic development, that's not a bad thing. So we'll, we'll talk about some wider issues here in a second. But first, since this is uh, hot off the press, uh, so to speak, President Trump finally announced that the U.S. would soon remove Sudan from its state sponsor of terror designation, although it hasn't happened yet. Uh, as you know, we've been pushing for the U.S. Uh, to lift those sanctions here at Crisis Group for a long time. And I think this has been an incredibly frustrating process uh, for the Sudanese people, especially Um, to say the least. Um, I know the Sudanese transition is high on both the UN and the AU agenda. How worried are you and others about the state of the transition in Sudan, especially with the economy in such dire straits right now? Well, I think that really is the crucial issue, the economy. Because at the end of the day, a government is expected by its citizens to deliver public goods and services. And it's almost impossible to do that when you are hobbled by the kind of economic constraints that have been created by the sanctions regime. And so the announcement by President Trump is most welcome. I think that it is a relief to the certainly the transitional government of Sudan. And now we need to see what next steps can be taken to actualize this as quickly as possible so that Sudan will begin to have the space and there will be support from other partners Um, without thinking about what the constraints uh, might be and helping them to 
get their economy, I wouldn't say flourishing because, I mean, that takes time, but to be able to, to provide at least the basic goods and services and responses that are required for the citizens to have confidence in the government's actions and at the same time to believe that the transition process and the process of rebuilding Sudan is on track. And I think that that is, is, is why this particular decision is so important and is most welcome. And, and I certainly hope that based on that, we're going to be able to make um, progress in giving Sudan the economic support that it requires in order for them to be able to take the next important steps in their transition process. Now, you also worked on the South Sudan peace talks in 2017 and, and 2018. Um, I'm wondering what was your biggest takeaway from that experience uh, in terms of South Sudan's future? My biggest takeaway uh, was that I think that it's very important for the South Sudan transition, transitional process, which is currently underway, to create a platform for the kind of dialogue and agreement on the shape of the future of the country that allows them, after the transition process is over, to begin to create in more concrete terms the South Sudanese state. I think that it is a country that is very divided, mainly across ethnic lines. That's a challenge for most countries on our continent, as you know. We are now creating nation states within the boundaries that we had. We had. It's not as if these states, you know, came up as a result of a formation process over time. And so people are learning to live together within that space. And at the same time, they still have these various contested tribal identities, rivalries, which has not been helped by years of conflict. And so being able to develop a system of government that allows for the different groups, the different you know, um, um, identities that call themselves South Sudanese to be able to build this country in a way that they can all feel invested in the South Sudanese nation. I think it is, 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 is an enterprise that will take time and that will take a lot of thought, but is very important if they are going to consolidate their peace. Yeah, and I think we very much agree that at the core of the South Sudan uh, conflict is very much the question of what South Sudan is and, and, and how the people will share power and their new state together that in many ways I think was never uh, never really addressed when they got independence. In terms of South Sudan, as you know, uh, there has been a lot of frustration uh, with EGAD's effectiveness from certain quarters, um, including oftentimes from the South Sudanese people. You were Ghana's foreign minister for several years, so you've seen both ECOWAS, the West African body, and EGAD up close. ECOWAS is often held up as the model that EGAD should strive for in terms of managing crises within their region. Do you think there's anything EGAD and its member states can learn from the ECOWAS example, or do you think the differences between the two regions are too profound? I don't think it's a matter of the differences between the regions. I think it's a question of what kind of institution do you want to create? ECOWAS was created initially as an institution that was to promote economic integration. However, over the period of its lifetime, and because of the crises that faced the region, it was very clear that there needed to be consensus on political issues in order to be able to create the policy space for economic integration. And then at the same time, we had our own conflicts. So you would recall Liberia and Syria alone, that um, two countries that um, descended into a state of civil war that had the possibility of affecting other um, member states. And of course, currently we, we still have peace and security issues in Mali, in Burkina Faso and in Niger. But you had a situation where the organization had to look at what its response would be and how it would be able to support a process of peace building within these countries, within the region in conflict, and what was the best way of managing that. And so ECOWAS as an institution has evolved over time as a regional response to challenges that are seen to have possible regional implications. But additionally, and I think this is where the difference between ECOWAS and IGAD is is much clearer. ECOWAS member states have always committed to financing ECOWAS in a way that allows them a freedom of, if you like, um, engagement 
that would not be the same if they were in, they, if they were looking um, for donor support for almost every initiative they wanted to undertake. And so, when ECOWAS decides that it wants to undertake an intervention, it has the funding to be able to get started. Uh, within ECOWAS, Nigeria has played a very important role, especially um, in peace and security situations, in providing both financial support, but at the same time providing um, troops and providing strategic direction in terms of getting together with other member states to decide what is the best way of dealing with the particular crisis that we've had at any time. I'm not saying that the interventions and the responses have always been entirely adequate, but there has always been a willingness and uh, it, it's, it's clearly thought that the region has to act on its own first and whatever anybody else wants to do in terms of support should support the regional initiatives. Now, I think that with regard to IGAD, I think there's perhaps more conversations that need to take place among the member states as to what kind of IGAD they want to have. Because at the end of the day, a regional organization is only as effective as its members want it to be. And I think that those are conversations that are yet to be had, or perhaps uh, have not had a consensus among all the members to be able to transform it to be as responsive as ECOWAS is in West Africa. And I think that's where the challenge is. Interesting. Um, you represent the, the UN at the uh, African Union. Um, can you tell our listeners more about what your role entails? So the office that I had was created about 10 years ago. And um, it was because, as you know, most of the peace and security challenges of the continent um, account for about 60% of the work of the Security Council. And at the same time, as the United Nations is focused and engaged on supporting member states to deal with these crises, on the African side, the African Union, through the African Union Peace and Security Council and its other institutions, is doing same. And so the thinking was that it was important to have coordination between the two institutions to ensure that there was joint analysis and there was also consensus on actions to be taken so that we could leverage each other's strengths and coping with some of the peace and security challenges or with most of the peace and security challenges on the continent. And so because of that, this office that I had was established to focus on political affairs, peace and security, and engagement with the African Union Commission as an institution. And of course, all of the other important institutions or sub-organizations of the African Union Commission that also have a role to play in this process. So we're talking about the AU Peace and Security Council, we're talking about the Panel of the Wise, we're talking about the peer review mechanism, and now um, recently the establishment of uh, FEMWISE and um, promoting the role of female mediators, etc. And so the key role of my office is to implement the joint framework agreement, which we have with the African Union, on how we collaborate together on issues of peace and security, and making sure that as much as possible, we are consultative, we coordinate, and we agree on how we are going to address these things together, so that we are starting from a point of having the same views and having the same engagement and having the same understanding of what is required in order to move these processes along, hopefully, along a positive trajectory, and at the same time, leveraging the different strengths of the different institutions. In some instances, in fact, in most instances, when a crisis develops on the continent, the UN Security Council pays attention to what happens at the level of the African Union and the decisions of the African Union Peace and Security Council, and these also inform their thinking on these matters. We increasingly have a situation where we have peacekeeping missions, and the African Union also has special representatives. Um, there's representatives of the chairperson. We increasingly have situations where both the AU representative and the UN representative are briefing the Security Council at the same time. Again, to ensure that there's an understanding of the different perspectives um, on the situation. And the, the same happens within the context of the AU Peace and Security Council, except that with the AU Peace and Security Council, very often I brief on behalf of my colleagues. 
who are heading peacekeeping um, or political missions, especially pre-COVID when we hadn't yet um, developed all of these um, other means of um, engaging each other. And so basically that's the focus of my office, to give support to the African Union in terms of the Joint Framework Agreement on peace and security and making sure that we work together to be able to address the crises on the continent. Last year, as I'm sure you'll probably recall, a crisis group published a report, A Tale of Two Councils, uh, on relations between the Security Council and uh, the AU's Peace and Security Council. In that report, we we warned that tensions were driving the two councils apart. Um, you're at the junction between those two. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, that was last year. What would you say is the state of UN-AU relations now? And, you know, which body really should take the lead on resolving conflicts within Africa? I mean, there's no doubt that the UN Security Council, and mind you, the UN's members are, member states are also AU member states, has primacy on these matters. However, there are situations in which the AU Peace and Security Council being closer to the situation and being made up of member states that have perhaps um, a more in-depth um, understanding of the political challenges political peace and security challenges within their region certainly have important insights and um, also have views that need to be listened to in order to find, you know, long-lasting solutions. So one of the things that we, we also do from my office is that we facilitate the dialogue between the AU Peace and Security Council and the UN Security Council. We endeavor to ensure that we keep both councils informed of each other's activities And where there are tensions, I mean, you don't expect any relationship to be, um, any working relationship to necessarily agree on all items at the same time. We work um, with the members of the AUPSC to try to explain uh, the background and what informs the UN Security Council's position with a view to seeing how we can harmonize our positions. And I think that that's important to do if we are going to be able to address some of these tensions. Interesting. Um what can African countries do to increase the continent's say in global affairs, uh, particularly at the UN Security Council, beyond what beyond what's already there? I think it's important to have internal coordination because the A3 are not elected to the Security Council as representatives of Africa. They are representing first and foremost the member states that sent them to the UN to represent them. However, There is a special relationship between the A3 and the African Union and the African Union Peace and Security Council, and they do consult with each other on a number of issues. My view is that that process of internal consultation has to be strengthened in order for there to be clarity on the side of the A3 on what the AU positions are. I do think that there is the need for... um, a greater level of understanding on the part of the A3 on some of the issues before they even get before the Security Council for consideration. Because they can then speak from a member state perspective, but they can also, as it were, um, anchor their their positions within the context of what the continental position is on a particular issue, if indeed there is one. And so um, one of the things that we um, believe is, is necessary and we try as much as possible in our comments and in our interventions to um, draw attention to is the need for improved coordination mechanisms between the AU and its various collaborating partners. And by that I mean not only the A3, but also the regional economic communities, especially those that deal with issues of peace and security. Because, you know, there's this whole issue of subsidiarity and how that works in principle. But even though the AU, through the process of recent reforms, has recognized the important issues of complementarity and subsidiarity between the work done by the Commission and the RECs, there hasn't actually been a clear definition of what that actually means in operating terms. I think that those are a lot of the issues that need to be addressed in order that Africa can take a common position and stick to it and then push its position and be able to advance what it considers to be the best re- the best outcomes and the best ways of handling some of their challenges. And which direction uh, do you think that relationship 
uh, should start evolving towards. And I'm, I'm speaking about the African Union with these regional blocks, you know, such as EGAD, SADC, ECOWAS, um, which, you know, w- w- where do you think uh, a good evolution of that relationship would, would head? Well, I think the first thing, and I know that some internal discussions have taken place on this matter within the AU, is to be able to understand what, on what particular issues are they going to agree to have coordination and how are they going to do it. And I know that one of the <coughs> areas that they've highlighted um, as a possible area for working together is on early warning systems. So now I think the question really is how exactly is that going to happen? How is that collaboration going to be put in place? How does that relationship also involve civil society actors? Because, for instance, using ECOWAS as an example again, WANEP, the West African Network on Peace Building, is an important part of the ECOWAS early warning system. Because, you know, in addition to having ECOWAS as the institution working with member state um, institutions, it also brings on board a civil society perspective on some of the conflict situations, a lot of the conflict situations within the region. So when you're talking about early warning and you want to cooperate and have better collaboration on early warning, what structure are you designing to do that? And I think that that is very much um, a discussion that is ongoing and is in progress. And I hope that um, it will crystallize soon so that we can then begin to think about, okay, how do we work together to strengthen those systems Because at the end of the day, if that framework is well developed and put in place, it doesn't just benefit the AU, it helps to support and promote and to strengthen this relationship between the UN and the AU. And as per your earlier question, it then allows Africa to have a stronger voice on issues that concern the continent. Interesting. Um, it, it also sounds like from your previous answer that in many ways, the question of UN Security Council versus uh, Peace and Security Council relations hinges in some ways less on the overall Security Council um, as a whole than, and, and more so on the relationship between the AU's Peace and Security Council and the A3, which is the, the three African members who are on the Security Council. Would you say, would you say that's more the crux of the, of the matter? Well, I think that it's an important piece. And the reason why I say that is because all the members of the Security Council have particular both national interests, but at the same time are looking to work together within a multilateral framework. But, I mean, there's no hiding the fact that they come to the conversation first looking at a perspective, looking at issues from the perspective of what are their national priorities, especially as, as regards issues of peace and security. Now, if Africa is going to have its views put across in a way that, you know, others perhaps may not have taken into consideration, who is better placed to do that than the A3? And I think that that's the reason why it's important for the relationship between the AU Commission, the AU Peace and Security Council, and the A3 to be strengthened and to have more coordinated um, engagement because it can only help the A3 to then be there speaking on behalf of Africa and putting the African positions forward. And I don't think, with the greatest of respect, that former colonial powers are better placed to do that than Africans themselves. And then in terms of the AU Peace and Security Council, what do you think is the biggest limitation at the moment in terms of uh, that body playing a, a bigger role um, with that mandate on the continent than it currently does? Is, is it about this relationship with its regional blocs or, or, or is it about its own empowerment within the African Union? I think that the African Union Peace and Security Council is a strong organization. It's been a strong institution. It's been set up um, in such a way that it has an independent voice from the commission and can take decisions that the commission is bound to respect. But I think that, you know, in order to be able to now implement some of its own decisions, the organization has to have the wherewithal to be able to take action and to implement AU Peace and Security Council decisions. And that has been one of the challenges of the African Union, the financing of the organization. Now, recently, with the not just with the establishment of the peace fund, but with the fact that member states have been paying their contributions to the peace fund, and um, a board of trustees has been established, and the management uh, structures for um, 
The management of the funds have also been um, agreed on. I think we are getting to a point where the AU Peace and Security Council, once it takes a decision on the matter, will know that the AU also has the resources to be able to take some action without waiting for consultations with partners like the UN or with other um, partners to be able to finance that kind of outreach and engagement. And I think that once the Peace Fund becomes properly operational, we'll see that the AU Peace and Security Council and the decisions that it takes and the way in which the AU itself goes ahead to begin to implement those decisions will um, be significantly changed from what we've seen in the last couple of years. Uh, while we have you on, uh, this is the 20th anniversary of the landmark UN resolution on women, peace and security. Have we made much progress in those two decades? We've made progress, but we haven't made enough progress. And, you know, part of the reason why we haven't made enough progress is because I think that until recently, peace processes didn't actively, there, there wasn't an effort to actively engage women in peace processes. I mean, the AU, again, through the um, development of um, FEMWISE and the training of FEMWISE mediators to make sure that they had the capacity to be part of these processes is changing that dynamic. And of course, the UN has been working on this particular issue for the last 20 years. But um, I think the, the progress that has been made over the last five years in terms of having more inclusive um, mediation processes is perhaps more than has had been made over the pre- previous 15. And I think that it's important for us to continue to build on that in order to make sure that there is that inclusion, that member states develop their national action plans, that that translates into actual institutional changes that take place to make sure that more women are included, and that there is a deliberate effort to build, you know, the implementation of 1325 and its successor resolutions into state policy. Now, that's going to take a bit more, um, I think, encouragement and prodding and... um, for lack of a better word, pushing to get uh, um, um, patriarchal societies to begin to think patriarchal societies that at the end of the day have governments that that have, have emerged as a result of the structure of those societies to begin to think differently in the way in which they engage in peace and security processes. But it will come with time. I think that we just have to continue to give it the same kind of um, push and enthusiasm and we can make things happen. Last question uh, on that issue. I'm, I'm wondering, in your own experience on these peace processes, can are there certain examples you could share about when you've really championed the inclusion of, of, of women in the peace process and when that's really changed the, the conversation? Well, my most recent example is South Sudan. Because when I was involved as a co-facilitator in the revitalized um agreement for the resolution in conflict or resolution of the conflict in South Sudan process. There were two other co-facilitators who were my, also my colleague, former foreign ministers and the IGAD special envoy, Ambassador Weiss. And um, at every opportunity, when we were actually engaged in the process of mediation and where it was possible to um, include in the conversation because of the issues that we were discussing at the time, how this could be looked at from a gender perspective, I encourage that conversation to take place. And um, together with my co-facilitators, who were equally supportive of this this process, encourage the South Sudanese women to speak up for themselves and also to make their views heard. Consequently, you saw that um, in the revitalized ASIS agreement, there was also the agreement that there will be 35% participation of women in their political processes, in the implementation of this agreement. Now, we have to move from actually getting it into the agreement to making it happen. And I think that's the next important stage we need to give give more attention to. But it was one of those, I think, opportunities where because of the efforts that we all made to make sure that women were given a greater voice, you had one of the new vice presidents who was it was specified that one of them had to be a woman, and it was also specified that women should have a greater opportunity in shaping the future of the country. I still think 35% is low, but in a negotiation, you try to improve on what is there, and I think previously it was around 
25%, but you don't just talk about having it in the agreement, but you make sure that it can be implemented in practice. And that's the next step now. Yeah, and of course, they, they have been struggling, as you know, to reach that 35% threshold like they agreed to. Um, we're going to, to wrap it up there, but I just want to say once again, thank you so much for your time and, and best wishes with all your work. Thank you very much for having me once again. It's been a pleasure. As always, thanks for listening. And you can learn more about Crisis Group at our website, crisisgroup.org, or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. You can also check out our other Crisis Group podcasts, our new weekly podcast focused globally, Hold Your Fire, as well as our sister podcast, War and Peace, focused on Europe. You can get those anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm Alan Boswell, and our producer is Mae Francis. We will be back in two weeks with our next episode.